Parsons was a genius. Parsons was a mystic. Parsons was a crazy man. Parsons was the most practical of all of them. Parsons came in and said, no, no, I want rockets. I want things to fly. I want to see results. Well, let me tell you about Jack Parsons. Uh, there's a great number of stories about him. There's a great aura uh, of events and people and places and things that he did. And one of the things that uh, I'm fascinated with is the, the man comes on the scene uh, late 1930s, early 1940s in Southern California at a place uh, that was going to be renowned for its development of rockets that would lead on into the later 20th century. He and his old buddy from uh, junior high, I gather, Ed Foreman, had been sending off uh, rockets, sky rockets, bottle rockets, uh, uh, backyard rockets. Uh, supposedly their backyard here in Pasadena was pockmarked with rockets that had been sent up. Uh, but they had reached the limits of what they as amateur experimenters could do. And they wanted to know more about what was happening. Uh, they wanted to know the theory behind the practical applications that had already figured out how to take uh, wax and gunpowder and make rockets that burned for maybe a half a second, two seconds at most, got a few hundred feet up into the air, uh, so you go to where the theory is taught. You go to Caltech. They turn up uh, at uh, Theodore von Karman's door, uh, saying to him, uh, Dear Dr. von Karman, we're just a couple of townspeople. We would like to find out a little bit more about rockets. Uh, understand you, you're the one to tell us. Dr. von Karman was a very astute person. And uh, fortunately, he was interested in rockets. And he would give good advice and other things, and then if something was absolutely crazy, wouldn't work at all, he had enough tact to tone it down and, and did not just to go after a guy and criticize him and says, you're a bonehead. No, he was very good. And he encouraged people to come up with new ideas, and he'd help them. They tried things with liquid fuels. They tried different motors. And one of the things that von Karman, who enters back in and all of this, came up with as a possible project for them to do since now the war was coming, uh, World War II was coming, and they were looking at uh, applications that had direct use to the military, one of the things they came up with was a thing called JATOs, Jet Assisted Takeoff. And they knew that jet assisted takeoffs were going to be difficult to achieve using liquid fuels. The problem facing Jack Parsons as a practical problem was how to get those solid fuels to burn slower and longer, and how to put them into a rocket casing that would, would allow it to stay in the casing and not have part of the flame, as it, the one end was lit, burn down the side of the case and burn the fuel quicker than just uh, right at the very end of it. The first ones uh, exploded rather than give us nice gentle propulsion, and it, we thought maybe it was the trip out that might have jostled them and uh, fractured the, the solid powder units because they were solid powder units. But uh, after that, everything worked just fine. Jack would go down before the test began and carry out an ode to Pan, uh, chanting certain words and stamping his feet up and down, somehow having an influence upon the success of the JATO. And it's at this point in life, too, of uh, my understanding of Parsons, that his life kind of takes a, a turn and one of the things that apparently is going on here is his involvement with the OTO. I, I don't know how else to explain it, uh, except that there are other influences that are coming into play that are, are changing others' perception of him because they know about the other things he's involved with. During this time, he did uh, looking for something to help pay the rent. <laughs> or, well, I guess he owned the place. But he put an ad in the paper uh, 
only those who are atheists and I forgot and oddballs need apply. And we did get, as you say, a diversity of people who were attracted to this kind of an ad. He gave me the Eliphas Levy history of magic, and we talked that over. And Jack told me about some of his careers and some of his aspirations. His, he talked briefly about the rocket that he wanted to go to the moon. One of the other things that was going on in Southern California at this time in the 1930s was the uh, rise of the genre of uh, writing in the United States of science fiction. At an early age, I became interested in science fiction, and uh, many of the science fiction stories were just sort of uh, imagination junk, but others were almost like a prediction of things that are going to happen, actually happen. And uh, when I was at Wright Field and other places, well, a lot of what I would talk about trying to get the powers that were interested in rockets came from what I had read in science fiction, the things that were really going to be practical. When Jack and I and all these science fiction writers were co-mingling, we visited back and forth uh, for Heinlein and we'd drive over there and I think Heinlein may have come to South Orange Grove, and uh, stimulated by this you know, creative environment, um, Jack wrote a story. A lot of people came around that were, they would come to the house and take him out in the middle of the night. He would come back two hours later, all, all very much disturbed. Then he started talking about the Black Brotherhood. I imagined because the er, the group of the whole sort of magical surroundings that these were guy black head hooded monks. Well, what he meant, men who wore black suits. Uh, exactly what they did, I don't know. But I do know from listening to oral history interviews that were done with others who observed them that Jack was a disruptive force in the activities at. Aerojet. A mutual friend of ours said to me, did you know Jack was killed in an explosion? I thought explosion maybe, but Jack was not killed. I don't believe it. <laughs>